Thank you very much. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, Amuna. Um, I, I'm, I'm back home in a sense because I'm, you know, get to visit my dad and I grew up here. I didn't realize how many personal connections I had with this kehila. I mean, it's so nice to, to reestablish those and for people kind of, it's like just one degree of separation for, I don't know, most of you, it seems like. Uh, <laughs> And so, um, thank you. I'm, I'm deeply honored. I'm not a scholar. You tend to um, pick scholars for this. And, um, um, and, and you know, we were going to focus on climate, and we will focus on climate. But um, when, when we, we, with Terry, we were, we were trying to figure out what, what is it going to look like, and then at a certain point I said, look, there's, a, there's an elephant in the room. We better, uh, we better address it. And then... We were talking about, I don't know, last week we said there's a Tyrannosaurus Rex in the room. <laughs> and, uh, so um, I'll give you at least the, uh, my perspective. Um, it's not just Shabbat Shalom that I want to say to you. I want to say Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Yeah, this is a Rosh Hashanah drash for Israel 75. I don't know if you're a one-day or two-day Rosh Hashanah shul, right? Probably two, right? Okay. So if you're a two-day shul, that means yesterday and today was Rosh Hashanah. We do the source. Shmot, you'd bet. Ready? Vayomer Adonai el Moshe ve'el Aharon be'eretz Mitzrayim lemor. And God says to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this is right before Makata Bechorot, this month, for you, is the head of all the months. And just so that God is clear, God clarifies the next line, says, Rishon hu lachem hashana. It is the first of the months for you, for the months of the year. Shana tova, emuna. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, Rosh Hashanah was Nisan, Rosh Chodesh Nisan. I did some homework for this. I didn't know all this. A lot of the scholars debate and think that in Judah, in Judea, in Yehuda, that Rosh Hashanah was the first of Nisan, but in Israel, it was the first of the seventh month. Tishrei. Now, Ismar Shorish, he, he, he points out that in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, there's a debate between two rabbis about this very point. Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua, they argue in the Babylonian Talmud about when is this. And what's so interesting is that I think, in a sense, it mirrors the debate in Israel about what does it mean to be a Jewish and democratic state. Stay tuned. That's just a hint for... So Rabbi Yeshua says, look, it's clear. It's very, very, very clear. Nisan is Rosh Hashanah because he saw the national redemption, the Yitziat Mitzrayim, right? Leaving Egypt, formed us as a nation at that moment. That is the fulcrum of Jewish history. And it's, there's no doubt, because the Torah says it twice, right? He's right, in black and white. Rabbi Eliezer says something else. He argues that Tishrei, the seventh month, is Rosh Hashanah because it is the birthday of, of the world, of creation, and is therefore more reflective of a universalistic message. And so obviously... You know, you have this tension right, right there. It's all there in all of its different kinds of manifestations. Is this okay? Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. What's your name? Hi, Rabbi Tom. Shalom, Shana Tova. Say Shana Tova to everybody on the way out. Look, it's, it was an argument, L'Shem Shemayim, 
about what should be the dominant characteristic of Judaism. Should it be nationalist or should it be universal? Well, obviously, Rabbi Eliezer won the argument. Okay. Because your two days it wasn't yesterday and it wasn't the day before. You weren't here then, right? And it has a lot of implications. I'm going to argue basically at the end of this Dvar Torah that we need, to, we need both. We need to reinstate Rishon Le Nisan Gamkan. And if indeed today was Rosh Hashanah, that means this god awful week that we're about to face in Israel is during a Sarat Yimei Tshuva. I consider it a historical privilege to be an active citizen of the state of Israel in the midst of this battle between our universalistic and our nationalistic competing visions. I consider it a historic privilege to be an active citizen of the state of Israel in the midst of a struggle for our soul, character, and, and, our, and our future. I consider it a privilege that my father served in the IDF in 1970 or 71, that I served in 1990 in the first intifada, and that four out of five of my children in this era uh, ha have served in the IDF. And as a Boston boy, you know, growing up on the Freedom Trail and in Fenway Park, I see that part of my own shlichut, my own sense of why I'm in Israel is an informal representative of our community, community's values and, and aspirations. And here we are in Lexington, the seat of the American Revolution, worried about our democracies in the United States and in Israel. A certain message, Rabbi, can come out of Lexington, maybe going forward, or at least tomorrow, when His Excellency the Consul General will be uh, joining us for a respectful uh, conversation. I have found it helpful in the last year or so to go back to original sources. I'm not talking the Torah here. I'm talking about Theodor Herzl. When America was 121 years old, that's pretty advanced for any country, a young Jewish journalist, Austrian journalist, he, had, he wrestled with the Jewish question and the different solutions that he was trying to find to our predicament, assimilation, immigration, conversion. He kind of went through all these iterations. In the end, he has the lightning bolt flash. It was spurred on by climate, but you're going to have to come tomorrow to hear why. <laughs> True story. Um, and he goes to see the barons of Jewish life. And he's sure that he's going to convince them through the power of argument that it's time for the ingathering of the exiles in the ancient homeland. He's completely rebuffed as a lunatic. His response, being a writer and a playwright, is to write. And he's writing this letter, I think, to the Rothschilds, which grew into a pamphlet, which grew into the book. And he published it, you know, 125 years ago, we're marking 125 years since the Jewish state was published. And it was, a, it was a dry program, I mean, it was revolutionary, but he basically tried to answer why in practical steps this is necessary, including how to finance it, because he was so mad, so mad at the barons of Jewish life. And he had two financing solutions. One was, it was the second crowdsource, crowdfunding campaign in Jewish history, right? The Mishkan being the first, right? And he sold shares in a dream called the Jewish Colonial Trust. And if any of you have shares on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange in a bank called Bank Leumi, that was the successor to the Jewish Colonial Trust. It's actually... Remarkable, before our crowd, before any of that, that was part of his response. But 120 years ago, he wrote a novel as he knew he was dying, and he just felt like he had to spark the imagination to the next level. Uh, Old Newland, Alt Neuland. 
The premise is very interesting. Not a great, again, novel, but a great novel from a Zionist Jewish perspective. There's an old non-Jewish guy, I'm sorry I forget the names, I didn't bring the book with me, who's had it with European life. And he gets a, a coal-fired boat, and he wants to go to some Pacific island. Uh, but he needs a companion. He finds this down-on-his-luck Jewish intellectual guy. Um, and basically says, I'll pay you a lot of money, just, just come with me. And he's like, okay, because he just like, lost his fiancé. Like, everything was going wrong, and he saw an ad in the paper and goes with him. The non-Jewish older man says, you know what? You're Jewish, aren't you? Why don't we go visit the homeland of your ancestors and see what it looks like? And they stop in the port of Haifa, and they get off, and they see a poor, desolate, depressing country, which is what Herzl saw on his only trip for 10 days to meet the Kaiser. Well, that was a nothing trip, disappointing. They get on the boat, they go off. 20 years later, they're going back to Europe. He goes, let's go look at, uh, see if your brethren did anything interesting in the last 20 years. They get off Port of Haifa, and they walk into this technological wonderland. They walk into this essentially utopia that, that Herzl just weaves. And again, an environment, well, well, Haskell's here. So I, mean, I am going to do a little, where's Haskell? OK. So, and also Mike uh, Gildas. You, you're not going to believe this. And also the rabbi showed me, of course, your solar. Uh, I know, you, like, you didn't have that many choices. You wanted some, a Bostonian in Israel who would, would appreciate your solar. So the short, I, I made the short list. Uh, thank you for the invite. <laughs> Herzl, 120 years ago, says that all the energy of the future state was going to be green and carbon neutral. He didn't use the term carbon neutral, but no pollution. Isn't that extraordinary? The next one will blow your mind that all the cars in the state of Israel were going to be electric. This is probably Elon Musk's grandparents were probably being born around then. And here you are with, a, with electric charging right out here with your solar. So thank you. That's very Herzlian. So, so the characters are discussing and they're seeing this amazing civil political society where Arabs and Jews get along, where debates are then, you know, in regal style with full respect, where there's a separation of religion and state, where the third temple is built, that is a cultural, intellectual center. Herzl. Well, my daughter, my we have five kids, my baby, who's now a commander in the IDF. Last year, she was on Mechina um, at Bina. Maybe some of you know it, secular yeshiva. So she was home a lot. And uh, I was researching Herzl. And I felt like I had to deliver, not only deliver Herzl a message at his grave, but I wanted to vandalize the grave in a good way. Because COVID hit, and we needed as a country to raise $5 billion very quickly. Oh I, did, oh, I forgot, the, the, this won't matter if I don't tell you the precursor. So there was a crowdsourcing campaign. But how, how did the Jewish people afford this amazing growth in this amazing state? He suggested we would float bonds for 20, 30 years at 4% interest rate. That's a key point. Now, State of Israel, COVID hits, decides they need to raise $5 billion quickly. And so they float bonds. Point number one, they were oversubscribed by a factor of five. There were 20-year bonds. There were 30-year bonds. And this is what makes me cry. They were oversubscribed on 100-year bonds. In other words, not Jews, not like your Israel bonds, which you probably shouldn't buy anymore because of smoke drinks, right? The markets, the world markets were oversubscribed. They're willing to take a bet at 4.5% for 100 years that this country, that our country, that Israel was going to exist and thrive and meet its financial obligations. 
for a hundred years. Unfreaking believable! So we printed out the Reuters article, got her waiting until the tomb was clear. We went in there, we sat down, we taped it to its grave, and we read it to Herzl. <laughs> now, right after Passover, momentarily, you can't get to the grave because there's this elaborate building that happens every year around the grave for the stage. They're getting ready for your mass mode. And this is really amazing, inspiring. A lot of flags and marching and pop stars. And then the favorite part that everyone waits for, the lighting of the 12 torches for the 12 tribes. And it used to be a non-politicized event. It's become politicized in the last couple of years. But it, 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 it is this amazing tipping our hat to history and to accomplishment and pride. And everybody in Israel, almost everybody, um, watches it. Before you go out to the fireworks, which were banned last year, because they were worried about PTSD from, um, from military veterans. Isn't that interesting? I don't know if other countries have tried. I don't know what's happening this year. I think everybody has PTSD um, uh, at, a, at a certain level. So when Terry did reach out, and thank you for the invitation. Where are you, Terry? Where? Okay. Hey, she's hiding because she doesn't know what I'm going to say. Um, it was essentially during the previous big tent government, <laughs> right? And we were going to celebrate the maturation of Israeli political culture. We were going to have this opportunity to celebrate the coming together across ide you know, wide spectrum of ideological lines for the sake of a common and greater good. We were going to be able to celebrate and focus on Israel's accomplishments in water, right, in agriculture, in clean tech. We'll do a little bit of that, not tonight. Um, like it, and Herzl would have been really happy. It would have been his vision. It would have been a closer fulfillment of his vision. But you, you know, you invited early, and. Um, we still need to come together to celebrate, and I, and I applaud that. And, um, but we understand the sense of fragility that we all feel. Now, I have a little bit of a different perspective because um, I run around Africa trying to bring actually Herzl's vision, in a sense, on renewables. In the last month or two, I've been in six African countries. Um, again, we can do that. You know, I know Matan wants to go into that stuff. We'll do, we'll do that tomorrow. Um, but what's very interesting is that when the Union Jack came down in Israel, it was the same day that it came down in Jordan, right? When these colonial powers essentially ceded independence to all these African countries, it was around the same time, it was in the same era. And the stark, painful contrast, right, that exists between this modern state of Israel, right, um, and then these countries, which is basically, you know, maybe we had a head start because of the Zionist movement and things like that, but you do get a sense of perspective and celebration and a true sense that something miraculous has happened in history, not just Jewish history, in world history. And, and people look up to us. So here we are in the third commonwealth. Did I skip a page? No. Um, wanting to celebrate, and for good reason, because it is an unlikely and triumphant return to history, and it's no small achievement. We're actually maybe the only indigenous people in the world to be able to have returned, especially after like 2,000 years. It's, it, 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 it's extraordinary, and there are times I, you know, I'm so mad at what's going on, and then I'm mad in the context of, of all of that, of the sweep of history. Um, but look, as we approach the 75th, during these Yamim Noraim, the, the government is moving further and further away from the principles of the Declaration of Independence, which I know I can talk about in Lexington. Spoiler alert, you heard it here first. 
Israeli democracy and civil society is going to win. I want to be clear about this, with your help. Right? Israeli democracy and civil society is going to win, and we'll discuss that tomorrow with the council after Kiddush. But one of the first tangible victories of the civil society, and tomorrow night is the 12th consecutive Motzei Shabbat, more people doing that than Havdalah, I'll tell you that much, uh, is that we've retaken back the flag as, a, as an inclusive national symbol. Sue's my wife, who's an activist reform rabbi. She, like the flag started to become radioactive because every Yom Yushalayim, Ben Gvir and his friends march through the Muslim quarter with giant and they're obnoxious as hell, and it leads to violence every year on purpose. And, and it became associated really with the, what we call the Hilltop Youth and the whole nationalist movement. Within two weeks, the flag belonged back to the right and the left, the secular and the religious. And it, it's amazing how quickly it happened and how pervasive uh, it is how big those flags are that they there's actually um like we didn't have a flag that big and you you go there's a place where you can buy like protest t-shirts and stuff but they have all these giant flags and broomsticks where you borrow it you just have to give it back at the end of the demonstration like they're very well organized and i love the flag and i love the symbolism of the flag which is why exhibit a is right over here Little things you may not know, which relates to your mass movement. So Ben-Gurion's interpretation, first of all, we call this in Hebrew pasim, right, lines. But pay attention, it also means railroad tracks, and that'll be important in a minute. So for his, the way he interpreted it, and you know, he lived right near the, the beach um, in Tel Aviv, because um, Jerusalem was not in our hands then. So this was the water and this was the sky, right? And that the horizon was endless, like anything was possible, which is beautiful. The way I like my flags is the way they have them in the Knesset, if you've ever been there or seen. The flags are vertical. They're long and vertical, draped down the sides of the length of the whole building. They're massive, and they're shaped like this. Because we should never forget that we were slaves in Egypt. Nisan, right? Nisan is about our, when we come, where we're birthed as a people. It's Yat Mitzrayim. The Yamin is small. You look right and left, and here's the walls of the waters of the Red Sea. And this is like us crossing in between. So I love the flag. And I love that it belongs back where it belongs. And it's one of the first tangible victories of of civil society. So next time you see your flag. Uh, so the protest is filled with an incredible amount of energy. Uh, and, and there's a difference between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. In Jerusalem, we count kippot. And there are too many to count. It's a great thing to see. Just a really great thing to see. And in Tel Aviv, you know, there's, you know, 20% of the flags are the gay pride flag. Uh, also, you know, like... It's really uh, amazing, and the mass of people and the young people that are there. You know, I'm sure there's more than 2,700 people who are marching who forgot to vote or didn't vote or are kicking themselves because that was the margin of error, you know, for, to get a merits in, and then I think another, I don't know, a couple thousand for one or two of the others. So, you know, uh, there's no mandate for a revolution. It was that, it was that thin. But the signs are great, because you have the biblical and you have the poetry ones. The one about the flag, I'll relate to you. It's, it's, it's a flag like this, but the star is descending. And the sign says, Israel yoredet mehapasim, which means that Israel is going off track. Right? The pasim is in the, the... So, again, every time you'll see the flag now going forward, you almost move on. Maybe you'll be enriched by some of the dynamics and the retaking of it and some of these interpretations. So, you'll hear more of my solar climate story 
tomorrow. But we left Newton, Massachusetts on August 23rd, 2006. And we ended up at Kibbutz Keturah in the Aravad, third most extreme desert in the world. So it was obvious that the solar was going to, you know. <laughs> it's a very special kibbutz. The, after the Oslo Accords were signed, they created the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies for Palestinians, Jordanians, Israelis, international students, send your kids, all the, tra the credits transfer. And there they also have all these experiments going on about desert agriculture, right? Because with climate change, increased desertification is happening. And so how do you grow food, medicine? How do you have, you know, use less water? All these things. How do you increase yields in a world that's heating up? Um, and is it 20 years ago now? Back when um, they were doing the digs in uh, Masada, they, uh, they found seeds. From the, from the siege, date tree seeds. Now, up until then, the oldest seed ever to be sprouted was a lily from an Egyptian tomb, 500 years old. They carbon dated the seeds from Masada, the date seeds, and they were indeed 2,000 years old. And they brought them to Kibbutz Ktura, Dr. Elaine Soloway, a, now a very famous botanist. And uh, they gave it to her to germinate, and she says it's impossible. She did a little enzymes here and there and the whole thing. And at a certain point, a sickly white leaf comes up. And she calls everybody over. Look, it's going to die any minute now. But let's. And sure enough, it kept growing, kept growing. And, um, and they named him Methuselah. Uh, they didn't know a, uh, I didn't know this about date trees. Apparently, you need, there's male and female. I don't know if there's the other category of day trees, but uh, North Carolina. No. Um, and so it took about seven years until you know if Methuselah is male or female. And sure enough, he's male. But just what happened is that with the Masada Rebellion, this, there's no reason. I mean, they already ruled. The Romans, they were the big superpower. They wanted to crush us. They wanted to send a signal throughout history. It even, what was it, a couple hundred people? That's all. And the amount of effort it took, they wanted to end the Jew in history. This was it. They weren't going to let anybody get past them. And what happened happened. You know the story. And they were so mad. And what they did was they cut down all the Judean day trees and made it extinct because you need to tend to it if you want it to. So as they wanted the Jews to be extinct from history, and the notion of Jewish sovereignty to be over forever, they took out the Judean day tree uh, with it. So how sweet is it that at least the male was growing in Kibbutz Keturah after 2,000 years? Well, secretly she had other seeds. She kept going. And um, they started sprouting. And uh, there was a girl. They named her Hannah. See, an educated congregation. That was the uh, birth of uh, Samuel, right? Uh, in the temple. And, um, and they did a carbon dating on her. She wasn't 2,000 years old. The DNA of Hannah is Babylonian. Because we were exiled in the first, after the destruction of the first Jewish commonwealth. And then we came back, and guess what we brought with us? Seeds from there. So, here we are in the third Jewish commonwealth, and Dr. Elaine Soloway decides to cross-pollinate Hannah from the first Jewish commonwealth, destruction. It was supposed to be the end of us in history the end of sovereignty. The seeds of Methuselah, second Jewish commonwealth, the end of the Jews in history. And, and the first dates, the Judean dates, are back. So 
I was trying to think about how to bring some sense of his, like this, what's happening now is awful. And you guys will, I'm sure, say a lot of very important things to the consul, and they'll say a lot of important things. But it's so hard when you're angry and you're worried to kind of appreciate the historic moment in the scheme of things. So Terry, come over here just for a minute. <laughs> it's Israel's 75th. And there aren't many of these, but you have five people on your committee and you have the rabbi. And I present you these are two boxes. You can't get these anywhere, folks. With the fruit, literally, of from the first sovereignty, the second sovereignty, that have now sprouted in the third and the third commonwealth for, so that each in your committee Get to have one. Uh, yeah. So, just, uh, so you all know that I do this other thing at Temple of Muna, that which, which is our anti-Semitism anti task force committee. We have 65 people from eight different communities coming this coming Thursday night to an interfaith gathering at Temple of Muna. 20 of the people are from Amuna, but the others are from eight different faith communities, one of which is a Muslim community. It's Ramadan, okay? And this woman contacted us and said, we're starting with a dinner. And she said, I can't eat until 7.12, right? They break their dinner, their, their fast with dates, with medjool dates. So I went and bought a whole bunch, but this, okay. maybe I'll share one. <laughs> well, she's Muslim, so who knows? <laughs> but this is really awesome. Yeah. Thank you. So Thank you. Just, uh, and, and, and thank you for the opportunity for me to reflect, because we're so in the struggle. And, and still, the sweep of history, we have to find ways to acknowledge. We learn in Masechet Rosh Hashanah that there's, that there's not just one new year, folks, but how many? Wow, very good. Arba Rosh Hashanahim. Echad Benisan, that's what they're starting with, folks. Echad Benisan, think about it, right? Echad be'elul, which I did not know about, and, I, and they're taking um, census of the animals uh, in Elul, because then there's Echad be'tishrei, where I guess you need to bring offerings, and I want to know how many, who has what animals uh, on there. And of course, Tu Bishvat, which I did not know that there's a debate about. One, uh, Shammai says it's the first of um, Shvat, Hillel says the 15th. I don't know where that came from. I think it's just because it's a full moon, and it's just nicer to be out. Uh, um, and um, so this is straight from the Mishnah, folks. Last night, the Prime Minister of Israel had the audacity to get on national television during Rosh Hashanah. Not just any Rosh Hashanah. The Nisan Rosh Hashanah Lam Lachim. Oh, for kings. This is the royal Rosh Hashanah. No sense of irony. No one comments on it, right? Give a nationally televised speech. We vow to continue the judicial coup that will give him control of all three branches of government and reduce the risk of him going to jail. And Rosh Hashanah. And Rosh Hashanah for kings. So my proposal out of Lexington, I think we need to reinstate Rosh Hashanah for kings as a day of critique, as a day of taking stock, of a day where they need to be accountable, of a day where there's humility if you know you're going to be accountable. Let's measure our leadership at every level, but that it was so insulting in so many ways what he had to say and when he had to say it that it just begs the return of Aleph Benisan as a kind of Rosh Hashanah. 
Now, this notion of, I was thinking of doing something more theological um, about, because uh, some of you may know I went up to Mount Sinai during the climate conference and I smashed the uh, climate tablets. I'll tell you about that later. Um, so the, the smashing of tablets has been on my mind. Um, but it's interesting. We pray towards Jerusalem, and you know why we pray. And in the Holy of Holies, it was the both set of tablets were there, right? The whole and the broken. It's not like we would turn away from Jerusalem because of the broken tablets and the sin of the uh, golden calf, right? That, that, or we, we accept it as part of a package, a package with a message, a package that even broken tablets or a tattered flag can still be holy, can still be the center of our attention. There's, there's, a, there's a message to, to hold the brokenness along with the wholeness, or along with the, the vision. And, um, and what's, I'm not like one of those mystic uh, gematria people who, or whatever, but I... And I didn't even look it up. I just said, wait a second, 75 is Lamed Mem Hey. Lama. <laughs> you can't script it. Or, right, why? 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 Or, Lima. For what? Right? For what? So, look, our president is doing his best to draw the line at the principles of the Declaration of Independence. So I want to read, I mean, you've read it probably many, many times. I just want to read a couple of choice quotes because it feels like a good thing to do. Eretz Yisrael was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here their spiritual, religious, and political identity was shaped. Here they first attained to statehood, created cultural values of national and universal significance, and gave to the world the eternal book of books, right? universal, particularistic, skipping. Here, the summons of the spiritual father of Jewish people, Theodor Herzl of First Zionist Congress, convened and proclaimed the right of the Jewish people to national rebirth in its own country, right? particular. This right is the, natu the natural right of the Jewish people to be masters of our own fate, like all other nations in their sovereign state. And listen to this. I'm sure you agree, but it's worth celebrating that this is how they said it and when they said it. And this is what we're trying, this is what we're struggling with. This is our benchmark. The state of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration for the ingathering of the exiles. It will foster the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. It will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisioned by the prophets of Israel. It will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all of its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, culture. This is for you. We extend our hand to all neighbor, oh no, sorry, uh, to all neighboring states and their peoples. Sorry, I just came back from Bahrain, that's for, We'll talk about this stuff, uh, maybe in question and answer. And the people's an offer of peace and good neighborliness and appeal to them to establish bonds of cooperation and mutual help with the sovereign Jewish people settled in its own land. The state of Israel is prepared to do its share in a common effort for the advancement of the entire Middle East. We appeal to the Jewish people throughout the diaspora to rally around the Jews of Eretz Israel in the tasks of immigration and upbuilding and to stand by them in the great struggle for the realization of the age-old dream, the redemption of Israel. And if you want to know what's the redemption of Israel, read Professor Nachum Gleitzer's biography of Franz Rosenzweig. Shana Tova.
You'll be the first rabbi. Oh, yeah. oh we still have some left. Yeah. <laughs> I can only proclaim, where's the microphone? Ah. <laughs> Freedom of speech. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone uh, want to start and ask a question? Manish Tana. Uh, Bob, Bob Russman Halpern. Uh, my question is, we're going to be in dialogue tomorrow with the Consul General. I presume he speaks for the government of Israel, which is the current controlling government. Is that First, that's just a factual question, just a quick answer on that. But then, what's the most effective way to talk to a representative of the official government now, given the feelings that you've expressed that many of us have shared, uh, that Rabbi Lerner has shared quite vociferously, uh, a government, I don't have to go through all the, the points that, that we all know, but how do we have that conversation? How do we even begin a dialogue like that? So th thank you for the question. Look, first of all, of course, he's an official representative of the state of Israel. What he's going to, how he's going to represent himself, I don't know if he's going to come in and say, folks, let's keep this off the record. Like, I'm sure, I'm 99.9 .9 sure he's with you, like, yeah, like he shares your worldview. I'm also 100% sure that whatever gets discussed will be reported back. Like, I, I, like it's actually very important. The demonstrations that are happening are clocked. You're probably all getting photographed. Um, thank you. Um, and it, it, is, it is important. Now, the consul in New York spoke out against the judicial reform and was summoned for a slapping. Um, and look, 200 combat pilots didn't show up this week. I don't know if there's a WhatsApp group for diplomats that are kind of waiting. No, I, I'm serious. If, if they're kind of waiting for their moment, I don't know this guy, is, if he has financial security and is afraid of, or not, and afraid of getting fired. Or, but we're in an unprecedented moment. I think speak from your heart. Um, I, I think I think just just be true. Yelling isn't going to help or any of that kind of stuff. I think also um, you'll probably get him to say more the more respectful you are and the more you speak. Just 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 from your heart. Um, I I think I'm on like a panel with you guys. So I I mean I I, I have a lot of friends in Likud, so I can maybe go off the record and say a couple other things too during that time. But wouldn't it be something if in the next week diplomats decided to do something like the Air Force pilots or the reservists or any of these others, or for prime ministers exactly? So thank you for the question. And the, you should know, and poor Terry, that invitation went out, I don't know, four months ago, and it was a different world. And then all of a sudden, two days ago, he was accepting. And it was like, well, what do we do? And I really want to thank Rabbi and Terry, like kind of think it through. How do we turn this into a, um, a teaching moment, shall we say? Um, but get your message through with the openness of your, uh, of your heart. And um, let's see. Thank you for all your comments first. What's your name? Alan Silver. Hi, Alan. Um, you mentioned earlier that you th were confident that the civil society side would win. Could you elaborate a little bit on why you're so confident about that? Yeah, I mean, the question is when and how. How painful is it going to get? How much worse is it going to get before it gets better? One is, is that it's not slowing down. I think the BB was counting on things, people kind of burning out, et cetera. Instead, it's, it's growing exponentially. Um, uh, like it, it's unprecedented. Um, I don't know, maybe in any democracy, it's unprecedented in 12 weeks to be able to marshal this kind of protest at all levels of, of civil society, almost all levels. The Arab sector is a little bit quieter. Um, by the way, one of the great things, uh, there was a great Haredi speaker at the demonstration in Jerusalem about a month ago who said, we don't like the high court at all, the bagats. It's more important to be a nation of lies. We're with you. Like it was really very, very moving. Like so many red lines have been crossed. Um, 
So, look, the military is, you know, BB says, well, this is threatening our security. It's sort of like trying to blame the soldiers or the pilots. But he, he's to blame, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's the guy under indictment who's trying to take over the judiciary. Uh, so we have an attorney general who is courageous as hell. She's really, and they theoretically stripped her of the power to incapacitate him, to declare him yesterday, which is why he had the uh, press conference. Um, so we don't have a constitution, so it's hard to have a constitutional crisis. Um, but uh, there are tools that are available, um, and it's just going to keep upping the ante because basically the court can invalidate rule, you know, over here. Uh, that everything they just do, that they're doing this coming week is, is unconstitutional, essentially, and they can say we don't recognize that. Um, the Minister of Defense is the, the key person. And uh, he almost buckled yesterday. Uh, he almost buckled yesterday. But I, as I said, we know about seven Likudnikim, and I'll, t I'll say more tomorrow. But it's civil society is so, this is Startup Nation, and we're seeing so much creativity. Even today, I sent you a video. It wasn't a protest video, but it was a protest video. Just on a, on a train of people singing Hatikva kind of thing. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's everywhere. It's totally everywhere. And everybody knows it's just about power and this particular family uh, that, that, that's ruling, which is why there haven't been any real counter demonstrations, because it, it'd be disingenuous, shall we say, because uh, justice and right is on the side. It's helpful that you know we're scared of Iran for good reason. Their enrichment is up at a record high level. We need America. Biden called, you know, Bibi. And uh, every European leader, every, you know, all these leaders are making their position known. But, um, you know, right after Bibi's speech, the, uh, the shuckle got weaker within a minute, I think. So it's, uh, you know, there's too many factors going a certain direction. The last time there was, and it wasn't at this level, the last time there was a major public outcry um, to go up against government decisions that were immoral and I think illegal was when Bibi wanted to deport the African asylum seekers. Deportation day was Erev Pesach. Again, no irony at all. But, but I, and here I really, like my wife had a major role. With, they, 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 they got 2,000 Israeli families from 90 communities, including the settlements, to say, if that's going to happen, we're going we're gonna to take asylum seekers and hide them, and you, the state, have to go through us. And allow pilots refuse to fly them. And it, it was just, it was amazing. And Bibi and Derry, familiar names, two people indicted, whose laws are meant to try to, you know, uh, they backed down um, then. And th these demonstrations, it's just so powerful. I'm so proud of civil society there, and it's only growing. It's just every week it's growing. And next week, the country is shut down. Next week, every day, there's other major actions. And again, like France has had demonstrations of truckers to shut down things and whatever. I don't think it, we've ever seen a democracy completely shut down by civil society in protest the way we're going to see this coming week. Something has to give. Something has to give shortly. Let's see what the consul says, and then I'll, I'll kind of pepper him with a couple inside information pieces. And look, it's, I, I should not give you any comfort. Like the, it costs two million shekels a week to do these things. If you donate to whoever you can donate to, Democrat TV, New Israel Fund, whatever it is. I mean, um, it, it, you know, whatever you can do, including talking to the consul general and pushing them there. It, it's not a foregone conclusion, but I think the momentum is with us. We, we kind of make a distinction about how, you know, four months ago it would have been different in Israel in terms of our feelings about democracy but we are losing a generation of liberal American Jewish young people who do not know how to reconcile Israel's 
um, treatment of Israeli Arabs and um, the occupation of the Palestinian people. So I think when we talk about the loss of democracy, mm -hmm. I think, you know, to many of our young people or many of us, there is really a feeling that, um, you know, all of the values that we have been taught are not being realized and that it's only a democracy for the few and not what you read about in the Declaration of Independence. And so I think while, you know, it's amazing to see what is happening, I think there needs to be said that um, I'm terrified about what's happening to the American Jewish community now and the loss of a generation. And I would love it if you would be able to, to speak to that. Because I feel like that's a Tyrannosaurus yeah. in the room. Yeah. <laughs> I, I obviously share your concerns. I mean, growing up in Massachusetts, don't blame me, right? <laughs> like, uh, um, you know my politics. Um, I've I have several responses to that. Um, and I'm going to start with the one that maybe is less polite. The year, the, the magical year that we had with the Islamic Party holding it all together didn't get us any love, traction, or whatever. There's no other democracy in which the Islamic Party held together a coalition. Like, there was no easing of BDS. There was no easing of the deal, you know, people would ask him about BDS and Israel apartheid, Mansour Abbas, uh, the leader of Ram, and he would say where this is, and by the way, there's a distinction between Israeli Arabs and the Palestinian issues, right? So he says, where this discrimination, we're working on it, we're taking care of it, and actually he, he like knocked it out of the park on so many things, it was really amazing. By the way, I voted for an Islamic fundamentalist party for the first time in my life. Um, if you would have told me two years beforehand, I would have thought you were crazy. Susan wasn't happy, by the way. I got in big trouble. Because they're not good on gay, lesbian stuff. So I talked to some gay, lesbian friends in Tel Aviv to see if it was okay. And they're like, yeah, we have water and we have power. If you think this is going to help the Bedouin in the South, go for it. So I feel like I had a, enough of a pator, but my wife didn't forgive me. Um, so even if we win, Hopefully really soon, right? Government files new elections, because new elections say that the, uh, you know, the opposition will win. It's just today, I mean, whatever, the polls today. I don't think we're going to regain the youth. I don't think we're going to regain liberal American Jews. Um, and, I, and it's not because of Israeli Arab treatment, it's because of the Palestinian issue. Um, and, um, and you're right. The, the notion of what's happening now, the lack of democracy, there's two big things that get pulverized, right? One is West Bank, essentially, right? And the other is climate. Because who do you think made the gas deal as killing solar? Undemocratic forces working with the current prime minister. These two things, like the more democratic it is, right, the more sane and the, the other changes will happen. And so it's bad for climate. Uh, we have one decision maker who's essentially in the pockets of Chevron. Yeah, thank you, America. Uh, and, um, and certainly on the Palestinian issue. Um, I was going to save some stuff for tomorrow, but I, I do want to let you know that the current crazy extremist government, they do care about the West Bank and their it's not getting better, it's getting worse. But in two months, I'm connecting the first solar field in Gaza with the support of the Israeli military, who had to get the political support of all the crazies. And there was no problem with that as well. So we can talk maybe more about that. I, I, I also think that... Um, you know, I want to go back, as I said about Herzl, to our sources. The way we've been painted on college campuses, right, is as colonial, you know, whites and all of that. First of all, the majority of Jews in Israel are Jews of color. 
It's like hafuch. And the, the darker you are, the more likely you are to vote for Likud. And, it, and American liberals are like astonished, like, no, the blacks are supposed to be, you know, the liberal Democrats, essentially. No, it doesn't work that way. If your village was burnt down by a Muslim mob, you may uh, have different feelings about national security and, and things like that. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's a fuch. And what I, the line that I used, I actually think we need to do more of, is that we are an indigenous people. It's not unnatural that we're in this land. Like, it's so weird when the Palestinian Authority denies, you know, that the temple was there, or the King David, and, and every week there's a new archaeological find that proves the connection. Like, it's an absurd lie, right? In, in the sphere of big lies, in the sphere of Trump lies, you know, that we, that we're, that we have no right and we have no connection, you know, to that land. And I'm a peacenik, like... Uh, we have to kind of re-legitimize our place in history and the connection to the land because it's real. You know? Those seeds were from Masada. Just read Josephus, you know? <laughs> like, just read the Bible. And, and somehow we're timid about making that assertion because if we don't make that assertion, then we are white colonial whatever coming in and displacing the indigenous population. And that's not the story, and that's not the reality. So I think we have some work to do in terms of our own re-legitimization. We probably shouldn't let right-wing mobs go and loot and do pogroms in Palestinian cities as well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You've uh, partly answered my sort of question, but I wanted to come back to Herzl mm. and Alt Neuland. Oh, great. Uh, which I read when I was maybe 11 or 12 years old, when I was in a period of speed reading through all sorts of things I now barely remember. The only thing that stuck with me really over the years in that book was Herzl's presentation of relations between the Jewish state and the Arabs. And it was a very positive, friendly, we're all going to work together yeah. vision. And I wonder how Zionism in so many of its manifestations walked away from that. I understand the pain around the war for independence and even you know, the 1929 riots and all of that. But it just seems like we give lip service to Herzl as Zionists and then we ignore parts, <laughs> large parts of his vision. Can you comment? You know, uh, yeah, that, that's very much a um, characteristic of, of the book. And you have to remember the era in which he was living and it was the basis from which he could dream. It was the era of the Ottoman Empire, right? He kept running to try to meet the sultan. There weren't, there weren't nation states before Sykes-Picot, before Balfour, before all those kinds of things, right? So his vision and his understanding, of, it was poor Arabs living in this desolate, ancient you know, corner of the Ottoman Empire, right, before Arab nationalism. And so his vision was, of course, we're going to bring our technology and, and, and everybody will benefit. And, and in a sense, you heard that in the Declaration of Independence as well. Um, and, and I think he was sincere. He was not naive. I think that was really where he was coming from. Back on the renewables, he, um, he envisioned the Niagara Falls, he called it that, from the Mediterranean down to the Dead Sea. Roaring turbines and crush of the water, enough energy for this future state, and that energy was going to be shared with all of our neighbors in the interests of peace, end quote. He really believed that, and it was before Arab nationalism really picked up, and certainly before Islamic fundamentalism, right? Which is the real, well, we would have had you know, Oslo would have worked if it wasn't for Iranian influence, Hamas, whatever, paid for, Gaza going off on its own to, like, I think we, would have, we, we could have had it. We could have had it at the time. And, but it was, what's interesting is not just Herzl. You talk to, it's a strange term, but Likud moderates. And there are some. 
question is, how courageous are they? And they quote Jabotinsky, right? The right-wing Jabotinsky, the enemy of Ben-Gurion, the socialist. And Jabotinsky wanted to make sure that there's always a vice president or a deputy prime minister who's Arab. He would have been the first to applaud Mansour Abbas coming into the government. So how far are we from the Zionist thinker, from the original vision? Some of it happened because nationalism, not, not, by the way, it was a worldwide, uh, it wasn't only, I mean, things happened around the world um, in terms of identity politics and borders and post-colonial periods, you know, but the actual value is there. And so I consider Mansour Abbas now a friend. I don't mean a friend of the state, as the guy I work with. Um, and if only the other Israeli leaders who I know had a as ethical a character, had a deep-seated belief in, they don't say coexistence, shared society. That's what Herzl believed in. And so does Mansour Abbas, and so do I. All right. Thank <laughs> you.